As we continue our study through the book of 1 John tonight, tonight may be a little bit different in the fact that we may do a little more teaching than we normally do, but what we're going to discuss tonight really is that important. That, that we, I want to make sure that we understand what it is that John is trying to communicate. Because there is a real danger, there is a sobering warning that he gives us in these verses. It's been a little while since we've been in 1 John. So to kind of bring us up to speed, we're reminded tonight that the book of 1 John is really a back-to-the-basics primer on what the Christian life is. It declares the proper doctrine as well as the proper demonstration of our faith. As we've titled these messages throughout, a word that continues to appear is simply the word real, because that's what 1 John is all about. It's about showing believers what Christianity really looks like. What it really looks like. Not how it's portrayed in popular culture, not what people say it is, not what people may intend, but what Christianity really looks like in the world. And so John, over the last chapter and a half, has developed and applied the truths of what is real life, what is real light, what is real love according to God's word. You know, one of the tremendous things about our God, and we touched on it this morning, is the grace of our God. You know, the grace of God will reach you right where you are. But God loves you too much to leave you there. And John has begun to develop the idea and the tremendous truth that a born-again child of God does what should be doing, what all healthy children do, and that is grow to maturity. And every one of us in this life are on a road, hopefully, and and God has purpose that we would reach maturity. Last time we talked, John was defining for us the righteous love that a believer should have. And it boils down to the direction of our heart's love and desire. For sake of context, look at verses 15 and 16. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. John says, you cannot live for this world and live for God. You can't do it. They are diametrically opposed, mutually exclusive choices. You cannot serve God and mammon. You either wake up in the morning and set yourself to live for God, or you wake up in the morning and you set yourself to live for the day. And God shows us through John last time about what righteous love is. And having established our heart in the proper direction, John now begins to move to declare the very real danger that is out there seeking to undermine the people and purposes of God. So tonight, we do have a solemn warning, one that we cannot afford to miss, real danger. Look with me at verse number 18, if you could. John says, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. John says little children. And here he's not so much pointing out their immaturity as he is pointing out his care and concern. I bring this up not because I want to beat you over the head with it, but because I love you too much to see you swept up in this. And so John begins to develop the the truth of the present deception. The present deception. He mentions here in verse number 18 that ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Then he says, even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Now John didn't get confused halfway through the verse. He didn't get confused that Antichrist will come, but there are Antichrists right now. He didn't get confused. He didn't get turned around. He didn't all of a sudden get his gears messed up. 
He was making a very poignant point. You know, when he says that the Antichrist shall come, he's talking about that man, the man, the man that we would know and associate from the book of Revelation, the book of 2 Thessalonians, the book of Daniel, as the Antichrist. I find it interesting that the Greek prefix anti does mean against, but it also means in place of. And that's exactly what this man attempts to do. He not only works against God's program and against God's people, but he also seeks to set himself up in the place of God. He seeks to be God. And so we have the man. You know, the truth about the Antichrist tonight is he is coming. He is coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 tell us this. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, and that day refers to the day of the Lord, when Christ will return, when Christ will set up his kingdom, the end of time as we know it, going into the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ. He says that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That is the Antichrist who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we see, the Bible is very clear, that in order for Jesus to come back, the Antichrist is coming first. So he is coming. You know, Hollywood may try to make light of it, and Hollywood may try to make all sorts of horrific movies about it. But the truth is, he's not some fictional tale. He is coming. And the Bible teaches us some things about this man. This man, the Antichrist. That he will be wildly popular. Revelation 6 and verse 2. It, it, it paints him here. Behold, a white horse. And him that sat on it, this is the Antichrist had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He was given a crown. He was given. It was bestowed upon him. This man is wildly popular. He's outwardly peaceful, at least at the beginning. You notice here as he goes forth to conquer on his white horse, he has a bow, but he's missing something. Arrows. You see, he doesn't have to have the arrows at first. He just sets up on his white horse, this peaceful man coming to bring peace over all of the earth. He's popular, he's peaceful, he's powerful. Revelation 13 and verse 8 says of him, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, uh, in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth world, that all that dwell upon the earth shall do what? Worship him. Worship him. Popular, peaceful, powerful, prosperous. You know, the Old Testament indicates that he will come from the region of the Middle East and that he will broker a peace deal with Israel for seven years is what the peace deal would be. He breaks it, though, halfway through. We see Daniel 9 and verse 27 say this, And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, or one week of years, seven years. This is the Antichrist, the prince. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So this man will arrive upon the scene. He will be popular. He will be peaceful. He will be powerful. He will be prosperous. He will do the seemingly impossible. He will broker a peace deal with the nation of Israel and her surrounding regions. He is one Slick, bad dude. You know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, describes him this way. Then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him 
whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. You know, the Bible is very clear that if it were possible, this dude is so slick and he's so charismatic and he's so good at what he does. The Bible says that if it were possible that he would deceive the very elect. This is one slick, bad dude. And he works the works of Satan. At some point, he's indwelt by Satan. Is it any wonder then, for the Bible says, for Satan himself can manifest himself as an angel of light. You know, you don't have to think long about recent events to know that the world is ripe for such a man. The world is ripe for such a man. Israel and her neighbors are skirmishing again. Skirmishing again, even this week, even today. You think about all that's going on. You read end time prophecies. And you know what nations outside the Middle East play a very prominent role? Russia and China. Wait a minute. The scene is set. Who is playing a prominent role? Russia and China. You think of the turmoil in Syria. Another chemical weapons attack today. You don't have to look hard at our world to realize that our world is ripe for such a man to come on the scene. And I think about the people. The people. How shallow and gullible we have become. We sell our vote in this country for the politician who's given out the best handouts. And if we as Americans, with all that we have and all the prosperity and freedom we have, if we're willing to sell our vote, if we're willing to sell our rights, it's not a stretch that the world over would turn over everything to someone who was able to give them that peace and prosperity that they so long for. And you know, at the beginning, he'll do just that. He'll do just that. Understanding this man, the Antichrist, though, it's important for us to realize that the Bible is clear that he will not be revealed until the church is taken in the rapture. Amen. The Bible teaches in 2 Thessalonians 2 in verse number 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The, the, the sin is already working, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And only he who now letteth or preventeth will prevent until he be taken out of the way. Let me explain to you a little bit. He that prevents is the Spirit of God, is the church of God, is the people of God. And at the rapture, the people of God will be taken out. The Spirit of God indwelling the people of God will be taken out. And there will be nothing left on this earth to prevent the man of sin, the Antichrist, from his rise to power. He's not going to be revealed until after we're gone. You know what that tells me? You and I waste our breath when we sit around going, I bet he's the Antichrist. You know how foolish many Christians looked when, when President Obama is the Antichrist. How, 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 how foolish we sound when we say things like that. The truth for we as believers, the Bible never tells us to look for the Antichrist. The Bible does tell us to look for Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Titus, chapter 2, 13 and 14, he said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I tell you, it's interesting to look at the man and diagnose the man and where he might come from, whether he's coming from Syria, whether he may be a Jew from the tribe of Dan that that turns his back on the faith of his uh, fathers. You know, it's interesting to look and hypothesize and, and try to figure out, you know, what, how it's all going to work in world events. 
But the truth is, that is never, that was never to be our focus or our perspective. We're not looking for the Antichrist, we're looking for Jesus Christ. We see the present deception, the man. There will be a literal man who sets himself up as God and is indwelt by Satan who will rule this world during the tribulation period. The Antichrist, the Bible says, shall come. But that's future. John shifts gears then in verse number 18. He says, even now, there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So we've got the man, the man, that man of sin, the antichrist. But John also says, there's the message. When he says here, the antichrists, plural, elsewhere John calls it the spirit of antichrists. These are the people and the movements who prepare the way for that man by preaching his message. 1 John 4 and verse number 3, later in the book, we see in every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, where have ye have heard that it should come? And even now already is in the world. Remember in John's time, one of the main reasons he wrote this book was to combat a, a false belief called Gnosticism. And it was some elevated higher knowledge that only the few illuminated or anointed had. And one of the things that they taught was that all flesh is evil, and so Christ could not be flesh. Christ could not be flesh. That Christ was a spirit that kind of came down upon Jesus. John says that's heresy. We know that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Amen, church? But John here says these, the spirit of Antichrist is even now preparing the way for that man. The Antichrist is not going to come on the scene with 666 tattooed on his forehead. Looking all goth. Looking like a rocker. The Antichrist is not going to do that. But sometimes we wonder, how is the world, how, how in the world would the world accept that man no matter how he came? Can I tell you how the world accepts that man? Because they've already accepted his message. They have already accepted his message. What is the message of the Antichrist? You know, as you study scripture, you see it's the idea of globalism. You see it's the idea of humanism. That we exalt man, that we build man up, that man reach his full potential. As we study scripture, the Antichrist and the kingdom of the devil, we see that it's, we see that it's globalism, humanism, that it's ecumenism. That, that is, you know, as long as you're sincere, we're all on the same page and it's all going to be okay. Because heaven and God are like the post office. And depending on where you start from, there are all sorts of routes you can take. We'll all get there. Ecumenism. Socialism. You know... Really, that's, that's very kind. The Antichrist is more of a totalitarian. You know, he brings peace, but he does so because he wants a piece of what you have and a piece of what you have and a piece of what you have. And, and, yeah, and all the pieces are his. Materialism, that I need my best life now. And when I think about globalism, humanism, ecumenism, socialism, materialism, do you know what I realize? You know what I realize? They're right here. That, that is the culture in which we live in. That is the day in which we live. You know, John said that this is the last day. And I tell you, the last day is that period of time, that, that, that church time, the period between his resurrection and ascension and when he comes back in the rapture. And this is the last day. And these things have always been, but they have progressively intensified. We have not seen a global push like we have today in 2018. In 2018, if you believe in your country as opposed to the global economy, you're a closed-minded racist bigot. 
What is that doing? That is preparing a way for all people to be good global citizens under the reign of the Antichrist. That's what they teach in our public schools. That's what they teach in our public schools, that we are global citizens. When I think about humanism, that is the American society, to make man all that he can be. When I think about ecumenism, that all ideas and all beliefs and all philosophies have equal validity. That is the culture in which we live. Think about socialism. You know, in a recent poll for the first time ever, more Americans said they favored socialism over capitalism than ever before. When I think about materialism, it is here, right now, and it has only intensified. It's doing it for a reason. It's doing it for a reason. Because one day, the man is going to stand up and he's going to be charismatic, and he's going to be persuasive, and he's going to be powerful, and he's going to bring peace, and he's going to embody everything that that social agenda espouses, and the world will swallow it lock, stock, and barrel. When you think of the political and religious message that's being given today, it really does all boil down to your sincerity. Sincerity. And the religious and political message today is this, as long as you're sincere, you're okay. Based on the authority of the word of God, no, you're not. The the political and religious message today is a social gospel message. Not that Jesus came to redeem the soul, but that Jesus came to make man better. It is your best life now. And we have all of this inner faith and we have all of these movements that muddle all of this together. What we see today is a different gospel than that which Jesus gave us. We cannot take lightly what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. He said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that has called into you, that has called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's some strong language. But I think about those who, who, who handle the political and religious influence in our society. And you know what? They bring, the gospel simply means good news. And they bring good news like you can have your best life now. They bring good news and that all we have to do is be sincere and God will love us and take us just how we are and our sincerity bridges the gap. They bring good news like... We can, we can stand shoulder to shoulder and arm to arm with people of different faiths. We can stand arm to arm with people of, uh, of the Buddhist faith and people of the, the, of the Muslim faith and, and people of, uh, of all sorts of different religions and creeds. We can stand arm in arm with them and we can all join forces. That's the message. When the Bible tells us that we're not to connect with them, we are to convert them. But they bring a different gospel. There are church leaders. And please understand, I'm going to put a disclaimer here, that these are probably very nice people, okay? And I'm not saying that any of these people are the Antichrist. I'm not. And these are very nice people, and if I had coffee with any of them, I'm sure that we could have wonderful conversations. But you have people like the Pope, who is presenting a doctrine, a teaching that allows Buddhists and Muslims and evangelicals, people who claim to be born again, to all band together under one umbrella. You have people, and by the way, he, he's, he, he has tremendous influence politically and spiritually. 
You have people even in our own country. Like I said, oh, I'm sure all of these people are very nice and they'd be very pleasant to have a cup of coffee with. But like Joel Osteen, who when asked, is Jesus Christ the only way to get to heaven? On national television, you know what he did? Well, you know, I don't really. And, and so the, the, the host then asked, so a, a Jewish person, somebody that practiced Judaism would go to heaven. Well, I mean, probably. As far as I understand Judaism, Judaism denies that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. And he hemmed and hauled and squirmed. And I tell you, the host lobbed him the biggest softball you could ever have. He said, so what about an atheist? Where are they going to go? You know what his response was? Well, you know, I guess that who knows? I mean, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Ultimately, it's up to God to decide, I guess. Can I tell you? That sort of watered-down ecumenical nonsense is paving the way for the Antichrist to bring under one umbrella all people in a political, religious movement. And I'm not saying that they're evil, bad, nasty people who, who kick cats and, 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 and torture other little animals. I, I'm not saying that. Like I said, I'm sure they would be very interesting and wonderful people to have a cup of coffee with. But the message that they are spreading, they may be tremendous motivators. They may be that. I'll give them that. They may be very positive people. I could probably listen to some of what they say and walk out feeling, yeah, this is great. But you know what they're not? They are not gospel preachers. And when they claim to speak for God, they are furthering the message of the anti-Christ. Paving the way for him to come. And the trouble is this, church. Here's the real danger. That there are born-again children of God who listen to what these men and what these women say, and we listen and we take the temperature of our culture, and we say, you know what? That seems all right. You know what? That's not that bad. When it comes to the difference between heaven and hell, Paul said, if any man preach another gospel, let him be accursed. And the real danger for the church of God tonight, the real danger for our young people, the real danger for our families, the real danger for our country and for our church is simply that we don't see the danger. Some of their books are on your bookshelves. Some of you turn in regularly to their radio programs. And the real danger is simply that we do not see the danger. It is the very definition of another gospel. We see the present deception Moving quickly tonight, Roman numeral 2, we see the plain distinctions. Look at verse 19. John said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Jump down to verse 22. He says, who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Verse 23, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. How do you tell when the danger is present? The Bible gives us some clear distinctions. It distinguishes their direction. John said they started with us, but they were not of us, so they went out from us. You know, many, many of these people and these ideas begin in local churches, but they do not stay there. Because error cannot coexist with truth. It can't do it. Now let me put a disclaimer here. I'm not saying that everyone that leaves 
harvest is the Antichrist. Okay? I do not believe that it's God's will that everybody in our community attend harvest. I do think it's God's will for us to have an impact on everybody in our community. But I don't think it's God's will necessarily for everybody to attend here. So not everybody that leaves our church for whatever reason is the Antichrist. Not everyone is an apostate. Some people have to go other places. Some people end up backslidden in heart. But here, John is dealing specifically with apostates. And what he's pointing out is that different doctrine demands a different direction. Different doctrine demands a different direction. And these people that go out, they refuse to accept the authority of the word and ways of God, and they set out to do their own things. Can I tell you how this works? How these people a lot of times will even use Jesus in their message. Here's how it works. Let me know if any of this sounds familiar to you. They begin to talk about what scripture means to them. Or they begin to use scripture to give people what they want. But they have little interest in what God actually said. When we meet together as a body and when you open the scriptures for yourself personally and for your family, I don't want to offend you, but it really matters very little what it means to you. And it really matters very little what it means to me. It matters everything what God meant it to say. And when we understand Scripture, Scripture is very clear in that for all of the Scripture, there is one interpretation. There is one context. There is one truth that God wanted you to get. Now, many times with that interpretation, there can be multiple applications. But if you miss the interpretation, you've missed it. We've got on this kick of what Scripture means to me. And what we end up with is what Paul painted in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust or desires shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And what their direction does is their direction leads them to an empty shell. They have the posture. They have, they have the look. But they do not have the power. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 3 and verse number 5, sorry. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such Turn away. The Bible is so clear that the closer and closer we get, the more and more men will arise and will pro pronounce a teaching that sounds good and feels good and people will flock to them. But if it is not sound doctrine, it is heading in a different direction. Different doctrine demands a different direction. So they're distinguished by their direction and they're distinguished by their denial. You know, verses 22 and 23 are very clear. The crux of the issue is that they deny truth concerning the Son of God. They may deny that he came in the flesh. They may deny that he was virgin born. John 1.14 really kind of clarifies that with a host of other scriptures. John chapter 1 and verse 10, that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. They may deny that he died on the cross, a literal death. They may deny that he rose again. The big one is that they may deny that he is, look at what verse 22 says. And don't miss it. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist. And we have so many people that look at that verse and say, oh, you know, I, Jesus, is, Jesus is Christ. That's fine. I like Jesus. Jesus can be a part of what we do. But notice what it says. It says, he that denieth that Jesus is, what's that word? The Christ. You know what that the demands? It demands exclusivity. Meaning if he is the Christ, 
that no one else or nothing else can be. He is the Christ. There is no way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. And so some, when somebody asks you, what about that pagan in, in a country far away who's never heard the name of Jesus, but, but they're really a good person? The reality is, he who has the Son has life. And he who has not the Son has not life. But that's not fair, people say. And I say, why do you think Jesus so emphasized that we are to go and tell them? That's not on God. That's on me. That's on the church. It's not a question of, well, in these rare circumstances, God just may make an exception. The truth is the truth is the truth is the truth. Jesus is the Christ. He is the only way. And anything less than that is a lie. Is a lie. We see the present deception and the plain distinctions. Finally, tonight, very quickly, the provided discernment. God has not left us to fend for ourselves. God has not left you and I to fend for ourselves. He has given us everything we need to tell truth from error. Look at verses 20 and 21 together. He says, but ye have an unction and anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. John here highlights two things that God has given us. First, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. He says we have an unction, we have an anointing, we have an enabling. We have an unction to function, if you will. From the Holy Spirit of God. Because every born again believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. He is our earnest. He is our down payment. He is our seal until the day of redemption. And the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. John 14 and verse 17. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The spirit of truth, would then it makes most common sense, would lead the believer into all truth. John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Hey, the Holy Spirit is not just some add-on. Because you got saved. You know, sometimes it's like the Holy Spirit is just, okay, yeah, 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 that, that, that's great. That's wonderful. You know, like you call the info merchant, call now. And if you call in the next 20 minutes, we'll double your order. That's not the Holy Spirit of God. You think about how precious and how powerful the Holy Spirit of God is. You know, Jesus even said that it was expedient. It was profitable that he go away, that the Spirit would come. You think about that. Jesus said it is better for us that the Spirit dwell within us than that the disciples continue to walk with him physically on the earth. There is something that we're missing to understand just what a magnificent gift God has given us when he allowed us to be indwelt by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit guides and directs, it convicts and connects. That's why Paul tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Most believers live their lives with little recognition of the Spirit, much less a filling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. Can I tell you, the Spirit speaks to us. He, he communicates with our spirit. And when something is true, he will identify with our spirit that that is truth. When something is error, he will identify with our spirit that that is error. But not just the spirit does he give us, he also gives us the scripture. He says, I don't write unto you because you haven't known the truth. He said, but you have the truth. What is truth? Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
In the scripture, we have all we need to know about God's will and God's ways. A verse that really sums that up is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 7. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, what is right, for reproof, what is not right, for correction, how to get right, and for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. Why is that, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, that you might be whole, that you might be mature, truly furnished unto all good works. The Spirit and the Scripture will prepare you and equip you to navigate the dangerous waters of this life. But having God's Word doesn't ensure we escape the danger. We must study it. We must correctly interpret it. We must appropriately apply it. God's Word will change our life. There is a real danger out there. And those who recognize it, those who recognize it, are the ones who are able to escape being swept up by it. Satan subtly, slowly, secretly seeks to undermine all that God has for you and all that God has purposed for you in your life. The present deception is that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. But you can see, and we can tell the distinctions by the means that God has provided for us to discern. You know, the last time, it's one of the big issues that people have, and Peter predicted this. The last time, one of the big issues, people say, well, where is he? It's been 2,000 years, where is he? Where is he if he's really coming back? You know, the last time Jesus came, it was predicted that he would come 4,000 years before he did. Genesis 3.15 to Matthew. I'd say we're 2,000 years ahead of the curve. But as I look around, I see prophecy being fulfilled all around us. And church, it's time to get serious. We can't play with Christianity we can't, without discernment and without filter, just allow things to come into our houses and into our lives because they were written by a religious person and they're on the New York Times' as bestseller. Oprah Winfrey said this was a good book to read. There is a real danger that we could get swept up and lose all our real effectiveness for the cause of Christ. You know, church, the Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist is coming, amen? His spirit is already here, amen? But let him come, because spoiler alert, Jesus wins. And may we, the church of Jesus Christ, be distinct, be discerning, and be direct as we deal with the very real danger all around us. Let's stand together.